Hello, I'm Ellen Basner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Monday, August the 12th, 2024. Welcome to the CJN Daily, a podcast of the Canadian Jewish News. Well, tonight, Jews around the world mark the observance of the holiday of Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av. It's considered the saddest day on the Jewish calendar. Because on this date, it's believed the first temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians in 434 BC. And nearly 500 years later, the Roman Emperor Titus and his legions destroyed the second temple too in 70 CE to stop a successful ongoing Jewish military revolt. The sack of Jerusalem and the loss of the second temple had devastating effects on the Jewish people. Hundreds of thousands were killed during the fighting. The rest were banned from living in Jerusalem any longer. Most fled to other countries. The Romans took 10,000 Jews to Rome as their slaves. And the biblical homeland of Judea became only a dream for nearly 2,000 years until the modern state of Israel was proclaimed in 1948. Some commentators believe the second temple was destroyed as God's punishment for the infighting between the different factions of the Jewish people during the Roman siege when different generals made war on each other. And that theme of Jewish unity has been sorely tested since the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel, but even before, when right-wing and left-wing Jews in Israel and abroad have been at odds over the future of Israel under the government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. As we hold our breaths to see if or when Iran and Hezbollah decide to strike against Israel, we thought it would be a good time to hear from one of Israel's leading philosophers during this dark time. In this special encore presentation of the CJN Daily, here's my conversation with Yossi Klein Halevi. He's a scholar, a journalist, and a podcaster with the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. He was in Toronto to speak about the impact of October 7th on Jewish history. He believes that after Hamas's attack, Israel made the decision not to be a victim. Instead, the Jewish state unleashed the country's full military power in an existential fight against Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran. And he's urging Jews in the diaspora to embrace their power and stand up for themselves rather than live as victims even if right now that seems daunting because of the surge in anti-Semitism. And we need really to extricate ourselves from this ping pong between victim and victimizer and, and, and reaffirm ourselves, our identity as a, as a strong, self-confident, and yes, vulnerable people. <music> life really miserable for the Jews, or are we just glued to a 24-hour news cycle? Should we be worried that so many young rabbis are coming out of seminaries anti-Zionists? And what does Judaism say about polyamory? If you want answers to these questions, well, we don't have any, but we do love asking them. Each week, tune into Bonjour Chai to hear debates and hot takes by me, Avi Feingold, and me, Phoebe maltz as we sit down with pundits, rabbis, and scholars to talk about the most pressing issues facing Jews in Canada and around the world. Listen and subscribe to Bonjour Chai at the cjn.ca slash bonjour or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, many of you have already been following Yossi Klein Halevi. He does a popular podcast with the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, where he's also co-director of a program that trains American Muslim leaders about Israel. He was born in Brooklyn, New York, the son of a Holocaust survivor. Originally, he was an extreme right-wing zealot following Mayor Kahana, but as he grew older and moved to Israel in the 1980s, the journalist began to explore relationships with Christians and Muslims. For decades now, he's been working on finding pathways to peace with Palestinians. Klein Halevi feels that despite how October 7th has now colored Jewish history with a wound and vulnerability he says we may never recover from completely, he is going to mark Israel Independence Day with a mixture of grief and gratitude. And he says you should too. It's an honor to have you at the CJN Daily. Welcome. Delighted to be with you. Thank you. Hundreds of Israeli families with ties to Canada, some without, but friends, have come and live in Canada now. They've moved. Yes. And I wonder if you could speak to a brain drain. I was deeply worried about a brain drain over the last year, going back to the beginning of the Netanyahu government's uh, judicial plan. And there was serious talk through throughout liberal Israel that uh, if if Netanyahu succeeds, 
in turning Israel into a Jewish version of Hungary, then uh, people will leave en masse, and certainly certainly young people. Relocation, that, that became the new word. It began with Yurida, right? That was the first term. Uh, then it became uh, Hagira, emigration. And now it's relocation. And so there was this sense of despair that many Israelis, certainly in uh, liberal Israel, felt. After October 7th, I became more, more hopeful. The country rallied in a way that we haven't seen since the Second Intifada, and maybe not since the Yom Kippur War. And the ability of, of Israeli society to instantly pivot from the most divisive year in our history to one of the peak moments of our collective purpose uh, really gave me a lot of hope and, and made, made me feel that maybe that threat of mass immigration is behind us. Can you speak to your previous research with dialogue with the Arab world and the Palestinians? Uh, you've written men extensively about it. You've written books about it. What do you see after October 7th in Israel for real possibilities for peace? How polarized are the societies now after so much grief and bloodshed? Well, Palestinians and Israelis have spent a lot of effort in convincing the other that they shouldn't trust the other side. And October 7th and and the aftermath and only, only intensified that. Neither side trusts the other, and both sides have earned that mistrust. Now, I am a very strong supporter of this war. I believe that uh, on the one hand, this is Israel's ugliest war, most brutal war. And on the other hand, it's one of our most necessary and unavoidable wars. And that has made dialogue with Palestinians uh, nearly impossible at this point. The only Israelis Palestinians uh, might consider dialoguing with are those who are essentially ready to trade our narrative for theirs. And I'm not ready to do that. I'm what not, does that mean? What does that speak? It means it like? means you have it means becoming essentially becoming anti-Zionist, and it means positioning yourself against the state of Israel. And I wrote my book as a passionate Zionist, reaching out to Palestinians or anyone in the Arab or Muslim worlds uh, who'd be ready to prepared to consider engaging from that place of deep love and an affirmation of my people's story. And that, for me, is the only form of dialogue that has any chance of working. The so-called dialogue of far-left Jewish anti-Zionists with Palestinian anti-Zionists is a mockery of, of dialogue. And I was looking for a dialogue of respect among people who disagree with each other profoundly. Palestinians and Israelis disagree about every stage of this conflict, from the beginning of Zionism to what's happening literally today in, in Gaza. And so what I was hoping to do in this book is create a conversation about mutually exclusive narratives. And I found a few partners who are willing to engage in that conversation. And my premise was that this is a conflict between right and right, sometimes between wrong and wrong, but it's a conflict between two indigenous peoples, each of whom in principle uh, deserves national sovereignty. And if you're ready to engage with me on the basis of that conversation, that I'm available for any disagreement that we may have. And since October 7, even that disagreement has become nearly impossible. And I accept that. I accept the fact that I have made a conscious decision to affirm the survival and the, ex the existential needs of Israel above 
my commitment to 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 dialogue. And what gives me hope is not necessarily what's happening in either society, but more what's happening in the region. It's surreal. On the one hand, large parts of the West are in the process of rescinding our legitimacy, our right to exist. And at the and at the same time, significant parts of at least the elites, the political elites in the Arab world are finally coming to terms, not just with the reality of our existence, but with the legitimacy of our existence. And the fact that Saudi Arabia is still committed to a process, not just a formal peace with Israel, but of normalization, is something that Jews should remind themselves of every day, whenever we're feeling despair about the Jewish place in the world. The picture is so much more complicated. And so my hope is not necessarily a resumption of a bilateral Palestinian-Israeli peace track. In fact, I think that that is impossible. No basis for trust, for mutual trust. But there is the possibility of approaching the Palestinian conflict within a regional context. The fact is that Israel, for the first time, has Arab allies. We've never had that before. And it's possible to imagine some kind of peace agreement, not anytime soon, down the road, in which there is security arrangements, economic development, where where Israel, together with our Arab allies, are working to neutralize the threat of a radical Palestinian state. It's still a long shot, but that was a scenario that didn't exist until a few years ago. You said this is a long way away. Yeah. What does that look like in your in your nighttime dreams that keep you up? Well, look, in Israel, a year from now is a long way. Uh, Ten years is inconceivable. So we're not speaking necessarily of decades. And um, and we I don't think we have decades to solve this problem. And you know, since since October seventh, time has become elastic. I never know the date. Sometimes I have to remind myself what month it is. And that's true for, for everyone I know in Israel. There is a kind of a, a a chaos in our ability to hold linear time. It's still October seventh. And we're we're in this this time warp. And so I, I don't know how to answer your question. I, I can't imagine what's going to happen next week, let alone next year. Talk to me about the trauma that Israelis are feeling on Yom Ha'atzma'ut. How are they going to get through when you have to go through these significant milestones of a nation when you're grieving the loss of a son or a daughter or uncle or hostage? What I'm hoping for is to be able to to be in touch with the gratitude that I feel for being an Israeli, the gratitude that I feel for having an Israel, especially after October 7th, when we got a glimpse into what it would look like to, God forbid, not have an Israel. The trauma of October 7th was it was a pre-enactment of what the destruction of Israel would look like. The border is overrun. The army is in complete disarray. Civilians are left to defend themselves. And so this Yom Ha'atzma'ut, I'm going to, 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 if not celebrate, I'm going to, to force myself to feel gratitude for the fact that we were able to turn October 7th around, not completely. And I don't know if we ever will turn it around completely. It's just going to be a permanent wound. I hope that wound will gradually contract but it's not going away, not for this generation. Is there anything that uh, you want our Canadian audience to hear before your speech? Thinking about what this moment means for us in Israel and what it means for, for you in North America, I think that we're going to need to adjust to a new reality that is defined by radical ambiguity. And by that, I mean... We are still 
an enormously powerful people. We could not do to Gaza what we did, and I and I don't apologize for that. We had no choice, but we would not have been able to devastate Gaza and to threaten Hezbollah and ultimately Iran if we were not a powerful people, if we were not a, a, a state that is, in the end, able to defend itself. And Jews in North America are still, despite everything, the most powerful diaspora in Jewish history. And to some extent, and I, and I say this with, with, with caution, still reasonably accepted by a majority of, of your fellow Canadians. We're used to thinking in two categories, either victimhood or power. There's a third category, which is power together with vulnerability. And that's where we are in Israel today. And that's where you are in the diaspora. And we all woke up on October 8th realizing that we're nowhere near as safe as we thought we were. But after, at least in Israel, after seven months of war, I think we realize that we're still able to hit back more strongly to give better than we get. Now, in the diaspora, I would urge Jews not to despair and to proudly own your power, affirm your power. The great Jewish achievement of the post-Holocaust era was the transition from the lowest point in our history to a place of unprecedented power and centrality on the world stage ability to take care of ourselves. This fight is just beginning. We are in a new phase. October 7th and the aftermath has opened up a new era of vulnerability. The post-Holocaust era is over. And we don't yet know what this era is called. But we are as strong as we've ever been. And we need to frankly own it without apology, without squeamishness. But that also means when you own your power, it also means realizing that you can't claim the identity of victim. And we're not a victim people. We don't belong in the world of, the, of intersectionality, in the world of DEI. We don't belong there because the Jewish people made a conscious decision after the Holocaust to reject victimhood, to reject the identity of powerlessness. And October 7th, was the reminder of why we made that decision. And so on Yom Ha'atzma'ut, we need to be grateful for the power we have and recommit to using our power in ways that will ease our vulnerability without reverting to the psychological condition of, of victimhood. We are not fighting the ghosts of the Holocaust. And yes, October 7th was a temporary relapse into the condition of powerlessness, and it lasted all of one day. But on October 8th, Israeli society made the decision not to allow powerlessness to stand. And this war is about reaffirming our ability to defend ourselves, whatever the consequences. For me, the framework of this time is not the Holocaust. And that's a very dangerous uh, historical analogy for us to make. Uh, it, it, it undermines the historic achievement of Zionism, which was to negate victimhood. We did it. For me, October 7th is a Middle Eastern event. It needs to be understood in the framework of the Islamic State of Iran, it's Hezbollah, it's Hamas, it's radical Islamism. It is not the Holocaust. And this is a moment to reaffirm the success of Zionism. And yes, we're paying an enormous price. And you know, we're in such a strange loop because so many Jews, understandably, if from my perspective wrongly, have lapsed back into the identity of victim. But for much of the world, we are seen as victimizers. And neither of those identities are adequate ways of understanding 
Israel and the Jewish people. We are not victims, and we're also not victimizers. We are a people that's fighting for its life. And that's different. You may have been following the news here. B'nai B'rith, Canada just released its audit of anti-Semitic incidents. The ADL, Tel Aviv University, right, also released their own annual report on anti-Semitism in the diaspora. And they talked about things like, if this keeps up, the curtain is going to fall on a viability of living a free Jewish life in the West. Right. So I wonder what you see in terms of the story that people know about what Judaism is and what Israel is in the diaspora and where we went wrong and wh where you see the problem. Because Canada is spending millions on Holocaust education, Holocaust monuments, anti-racism training, and it's not working. No, it's it's having the opposite effect. The Holocaust is now being turned against us. Uh, there was a demonstration at the gate of Auschwitz a couple of days ago against the March of the Living, a pro-Palestinian demonstration. Now, that's never happened before. Now, it was small, but symbolically perfect for this time. It really summed up what we're facing, the shamelessness, the transformation of our story from one of the most uh, noble examples of human endurance and faith and, and triumph over adversity into the exact opposite. And so it's not working. Holocaust education is, a, is in Holocaust education outside of the Jewish community is, is a near total failure. And I think the main reason for that is that we went too far in universalizing the lessons of the Holocaust. The Holocaust is, is, is unique, is a unique event, but so is the hatred that made the Holocaust possible. Anti-Semitism cannot be conflated with racism. Now, obviously, there's a lot of overlap, but anti-Semitism works differently than other forms of racism. For me, the definition of anti-Semitism is this, the, the transformation of the Jews into the symbol for whatever a given civilization defines as its most detestable qualities. Under Christianity, until the Holocaust, the Jew was Christ killer. Nothing worse than that for Christianity. Uh, in Islam, the Jew was the killer of prophets. That was the that's how we were referred to, uh, and on and on. Under Marxism, under Nazism, the Jew represented the ultimate, the ultimate negative qualities. And today, in a civil living in a civilization that prides itself on anti-racism, the Jewish state emerges as the symbol of racism, and so. We're looking at a pattern here, and that's what needs to be taught in Holocaust education. What is the specificity of anti-Semitism that makes it history's most enduring hatred, most malleable hatred, the, the, the hatred that, that is able, the most adaptable of, of, of all hatreds? And so in, in that sense, the irony is that Holocaust education helped prepare the, the ground for Israel emerging as the symbol of racism. And, and you hear this over and over again. We are opposing Israel in the name of the Holocaust. And you're the ones who are betraying the Holocaust. How dare you use the Holocaust? How dare you hide behind the Holocaust? This is what's, what Holocaust educators need to deal with now. There needs to be a fundamental rethinking of Holocaust education. Don't hold your breath. Because it's such an institution. Absolutely. And because it, it's, it's the perfect means to convey the message, and basically any message. You, you have a problem with bullying in schools, here's the Holocaust. Racism, the Holocaust. And right now, the Holocaust, is it, it is valid to use the Holocaust for any issue except, except protecting the Jewish people. I'm honored was, that you spent this time with me and it was, was really, really nice to meet you. Thank you very Pleasure. much. Thank you. 
And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily. We'll be running some encore episodes over the next few days during and after Tisha B'Av. If breaking news happens, be sure to check the CJN's website for the latest developments. The Daily is produced by Zachary Judah Kaufman. Our executive producer is Michael Freeman, And our music was composed by Dov beck Levine. I'm Ellen Besner. Thanks for listening. Y'all remember that joke from Airplane? The old lady asked for some light reading. How about this leaflet? Famous Jewish sports legends. But in actuality, that's changing. Jews are crushing it in sports around the world, and we are here to celebrate them. Sandy Kopak gets his 10th strikeout. Zach Hyman, his first career hat trick. 41 points for Diddy Obvio. It's Sue Bird's building. I'm Gabe. And I'm Jamie. We love Jews and we love sports, but most of all, we love quelling over Jews in sports. Together we host Mensch Warmers, the longest running Jewish sports podcast in the world. Listen and subscribe at the cjn.ca and wherever you find your podcasts.